Crested geckos are easily within the top five most popular pet lizards the world over, and they are commonly recommended as a starter lizard, being that they are hardy and easy to keep. But in amongst all that, most people don't actually know how to keep them properly. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing how to care for a crested gecko with a mindset of achieving the best welfare for that animal, rather than just following the crowd and doing what seems to work or is convenient, which isn't really in the animal's best interest. Now, because of that, you might find that some of the information I'm going to share does sort of disagree with other things and you might find it to be a bit contentious, but whatever the case, at the time of publishing, all of the information that I am sharing is up to date and is correct, so you can rest assured that if you follow the advice in this video, that you are going to be giving your crested gecko a good quality of life. But with that in mind, what you can gather I'm going to be doing in today's video is completely breaking down crested gecko care so that you know how to keep a crested gecko properly. So with that, I'm JTB Reptiles and let's get straight into the video. Now for those people who have only just heard about crested geckos and don't know much about them, we are going to start off this video doing a very basic introduction to crested geckos and what they are, so that you can get a general gist about whether they are going to be the right animal for you, just based on personal preferences. So crested geckos, otherwise known as eyelash geckos or just cresties amongst reptile keepers, are a small species of lizard attaining maximum lengths of approximately 14 centimetres, measuring from the tip of the snout to the cloaca or the vent, which is where they poo from basically. Now the reason that we measure this distance rather than the distance between the tip of the snout and the tip of the tail is because in the wild, tail length in lizards is extremely variable because they often lose bits of the tail. So it is a bit more representative to just measure what we call the snout vent length. Now on that note, most lizards can shed parts of their tail, which is what we call autotomy. So basically they purposefully dump part of their body so that a predator will go for that and leave the gecko like, able to run away because it's actually not harmed in and of itself. Now, an interesting fact about crested geckos is that if they do perform autotomy on their tail, that it cannot grow back, and instead what you get is just like a little stub. Like most other geckos, crested geckos do have lamellae on the bottom of their toes, and basically what this means is that they have little sticky adhesion pads that allow them to climb smooth surfaces, including glass, and it also allows them to climb on smooth surfaces whilst they are upside down, which is quite amazing. Then also, like other geckos, cresties don't have any eyelids, instead they just have a protective scale cover in the eye, and to keep this clean they do actually lick it. Perhaps the most noticeable feature about crested geckos is their head, which is a really weird wedge shape, I mean, I don't know, but it kind of looks like a big Dorito, especially when the cresties are orange like mine, um, but running parallel to the sides of the head and right down the back is a double crest which is what gives them their name. I mean to be honest was there much point me telling you that though because I mean like it's called a crested gecko, it's got crests alright. Now in the wild crested geckos do actually come from a small archipelago called New Caledonia which most people haven't heard of but it's basically just off the east coast of Australia. Uh, and this place is very, very heavily forested, quite warm and quite humid, and this is going to have serious implications for how we are going to keep them in captivity, so do keep that in mind. And the last little bit of information about crested geckos is that they are crepuscular, which means that they are most active at dawn and dusk. Now, there is some outdated advice or information, I should really say, um, telling you that they are nocturnal, meaning that they are awake only in the night. But this really isn't true, and this is actually also very important for how we're meant to keep them. So moving on to the setup for a crested gecko, um, as you can tell, my crested setup is over here, um, and what you're basically going to want to do in setting them up is try to recreate that slice of jungle that would be their home out in the wild. Um, and on that note, this is a sort of point that you are going to see is very important in keeping any animal, and that is that to keep them successfully, you have to try and follow nature's example. 
So making up a jungle setup is actually a lot easier in a glass enclosure than say a wooden one um, for a number of reasons but the primary one being that you are going to need high humidity in the enclosure and a wooden one is just not going to take that, the wood's going to warp and bend and rot and all nasty things but you don't have that problem with a glass enclosure. Now the glass enclosure is available for reptiles um, you do have like the sort of branded ones like the Exoterra which my crest is in and then you can also get like custom purpose built ones that are bespoke such as the DMS Vivarium which is on my right that does house my Lime Day geckos. Now my personal preference is for bespoke ones because you can get them in the sizes you want and you just have a lot more freedom with them plus the generally better value for money um, than the proprietary ones. But as we do mention that, uh, I am just going to throw in now that all of the stuff that you're going to need for keeping a crested gecko that I mentioned in this video, I will chuck links and like Amazon links down in the description so that you can go and get those things. I am also legally obligated to give you the disclaimer that I am an Amazon associate and as such when you get something from those links, I get a small amount of commission from that. You don't actually have to pay any more, it just means that the money lines my pocket instead of Bezos's. Anyway, scooting past that little tangent, the minimum cage size that I would personally recommend for a crested gecko of any age, a single crested gecko on its own that is, is 45 centimeters long, then 45 centimeters deep and 60 centimeters tall, or if you're an inch person, uh, I think that's 18 by 18 by 24 inches. Now I've mentioned a couple of things there that you might have had a couple of queries about. The first being that that is the minimum cage size for any age crested gecko. You will need very often that you should buy a smaller enclosure for a young crested gecko and continually upgrade it towards a full size enclosure as it gets older. But I personally would disagree with that. Um, you know, I started off with my crested gecko, literally it was only two grams, he was probably too small to actually be buying him, but I didn't know this several years ago. But that's another tangent we'll ignore. Um, but basically, I've had him in the same size enclosure ever since I've had him, and I've never had any problems. And the reason for this, I think, is that most people don't decorate their enclosures heavily enough. So if you think of a crested gecko in the wild, if it's living in trees and all jungle plants and things, it can hide basically in plain sight wherever it wants, but then people put a very small animal in a quite spacious enclosure and only put like one plant in it and somehow expect it to feel secure. That's just not gonna work. And so I think it is definitely more cost effective to start out with that full size enclosure, not have to worry about upgrading it. It gives your gecko more space you just have to take the precaution of decorating it properly. The other thing that I alluded to was keeping crested geckos in groups. Now this is a very, very big topic for reptiles on the whole, i.e. can you keep multiples together? And it's something that I am gonna talk about more in the coming months. But basically, if you're a beginner watching this video, just take it that you should probably keep a crested gecko alone because although there are benefits, genuine benefits to the animal of keeping them in groups, the repercussions of it going wrong are much greater than what you lose out on if you just keep them alone. So it is my recommendation to just get one, especially if you're just starting out. But back on to decorating the enclosure, you can see that both of the enclosures behind me and also the rest of the enclosures that I have, apart from one quarantine setup actually, um, they are all live planted. Now, you do have a choice in setting up a crested gecko. You could go down the route where you use fake plants, like silk ones or plastic ones, or you could go down the live plant route. You can obviously tell, as I've just said, that I do prefer live plants. The reason for this is that they, you know, they just look better, don't they? You're not gonna mimic it perfectly with a plastic plant. And just knowing that they are real plants is just nice, in my opinion. Plus, they are actually a bit more hygienic because you know, if you get them growing well, then you're cutting the leaves off and they are gone after, you know, after a month or two's time. Versus if you've got plastic plants, then you're perpetually cleaning them and as they get poo on them and other waste, it just builds up and they're never gonna be perfectly clean again. So there is that. Now, if you're gonna use live plants, which I would seriously recommend, then you may as well go the whole hog and set up a bioactive enclosure. 
Now a bioactive enclosure is basically the same as another enclosure, only the substrate, which is basically the soil that you put on the bottom of the enclosure. Um, you allow woodlice, springtails and other invertebrates to live in it and they will clean the enclosure out for you or to an extent at least. Now bioactivity is again something that I am very very big on so if you want to find out more about it then do check out the other videos on my channel. Now in terms of substrate which is the floor covering I just talked about you do have a couple of options and um, some people recommend just paper towels or newspaper and um, other people recommend coconut fiber orchid bark and um, cypress mulch is another one but personally the absolute best that I think you can buy is just simple plain old natural mixes of soils now for this you can use just plain organic topsoil although there are some like reptile marketed ones that i do recommend namely the arcadia earth mix series for crested geckos you are going to want to go for the just the standard earth mix people commonly do worry about um whether the crested gecko is going to get impacted which for people who don't know it basically means if the animal eats the substrate then like its gut gets clogged with it and basically that kills it over time um, so there is a concern of this in using a loose substrate rather than a flat one such as paper towel but if you do use a natural particulate substrate and your animal is healthy the risks of that are very very small and it's not something i've ever encountered so i think personally that the benefits of using a loose substrate do greatly outweigh the potential risks. Oh, and as a final note on enclosure setup, you don't just want to have plants in the enclosure, try and get some hardscape in there too, which is basically just get some cork bark in and some branches and things. Now you might decide to make a background for, in, for your enclosure and there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, some people like to use expanding foam, you know, like cavity filler for homes. Uh, and they carve it and then they either paint it or cover it in like cement or something um, or sometimes people do like press coconut fibre to it but my personal preference is to go for something more natural so basically get pieces of cork bark which is just a type of wood again a link for it will be in the description and then just use some aquarium safe silicone sealant and like stick the bits of cork bark to the back of the enclosure um, alternatively you can just get like pre-made sheets of cork that you stick in that's what I've got for my crested gecko but since I've developed in the reptile hobby I have started using those cork backgrounds uh, I made a similar thing for my leopard gecko not not long ago um, and I do also have one in, in there for the Latin day geckos so again if you want to find out how to build such a background then feel free to check out those videos the purpose of having hardscape is that if your plants haven't grown in yet then your crestie is still going to have something to climb on and also plants are often quite flimsy in the leaves even fake ones so although your crested gecko can hide in them to an extent having that bit of hardscape is just a bit better so another thing that i've mentioned a lot is that you do want to maintain a reasonably high humidity for a crested gecko now to do this all you're going to do is spray down the enclosure once or twice a day with dechlorinated water now dechlorinated water is just water out the tap and then you add a dechlorinating agent to it such as Sumed's Reptisafe which again you can get from a link down in the description and adding this basically removes any potentially harmful chlorine or chloramines from that water. Um, you know I say potentially harmful because it's probably not going to kill your gecko and most people don't do it but it's not natural so removing it is something I do always recommend. To measure your humidity you can get a bit of apparatus called a hygrometer and if you get one of those you do sort of want to aim for a humidity of about 80% and I don't really actually recommend that. Um, but what I mean by this is that I don't think that chasing numbers is ever a good idea with keeping reptiles when it comes to temperatures or humidity. And, you know I'll talk about temperatures in a second but just looking at humidity for a minute um, if you try and chase that magic 80% you're constantly spraying going in out in out you're probably not gonna do anything good for your gecko you're just gonna worry yourself and um, so just sort of play it by ear you know you want the enclosure to be humid 
but you don't want it sopping wet and that is what I would aim for rather than a number. Um, the reason for this being that different hygrometers are going to give you different numbers because they are calibrated differently. So using them as an absolute measurement actually isn't as useful as it may seem. Time for a little bit more myth busting. Um, now what you'll read in other articles or watch on other videos is that apparently crested geckos can only recognise water droplets to drink from and that is one of the reasons why it's essential to spray them. Now I actually do disagree with this as well um, and I always do offer standing water to my crested gecko and I've seen him drink it, they do recognise standing water as something that they can access water from so it is important to leave a water bowl in for them at all times so that they can hydrate themselves when they want to rather than just when you get round to spraying them. <sighs> and now we probably have the most controversial part of this video. Heating and lighting is a massive subject in keeping reptiles and I have, well, started at least, a complete series breaking it down for you. Um, but for this particular species, heating and lighting is a very, I was going to say hot topic, but cold topic in the sense that basically nobody does it at all. The misnomer usually goes that crested geckos are crepuscular or nocturnal and as such they don't require any UV lighting. Then people go on to say that because they are crepuscular or nocturnal um, their eyes are very sensitive to light and so adding any additional visible lighting visible lighting, which I say angrily because it's such a poor name, um, that that is going to hurt their eyes. And then people also go on to say that if you heat them to above 27 degrees C, which is sort of the mid 80s Fahrenheit, um, that they are going to succumb to heat stress and die. Now, uh, if you're seeing what I'm seeing, That's the door to my house. So what I was intending on saying was that if you're seeing what I'm seeing, that is a crested gecko enclosure that has got bright LED vi visible lighting on it. It's also got a UVB bulb on it and it's also got a heat lamp on it. So why is my crested gecko not blind? Why is it not being killed by the UV? And why is it not being killed by the hotspot? Basically, what I'm telling you is that what other people are telling you is a load of rubbish. Where crested geckos come from in the wild, they do regularly experience temperatures of like up to almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit or about 32 degrees Celsius. Um, and basically what this means is that they should be able to cope with that if they are being kept properly. Now, consequently, what I do is I do have a small incandescent heat light over my crested gecko that comes on just for 12 hours a day, timed with a mechanical timer. And what this does is it provides a small zone in his enclosure that reaches those 30 degree temperatures so that if he wants, he can choose to bask in it. Um, and occasionally he does do that. And personally, I am always going to argue that if they use it and if they have exposure to it in the wild, and it's not like obviously detrimental to them, like for example disease would be as a factor in the wild, um, then what we should be doing is trying to offer them that in captivity. Moreover, the UV index, which is basically a measure of the intensity of ultraviolet light, um, so the UV index in New Caledonia can be really quite high indeed. Um, now, crested geckos, it is true that they are crepuscular, so they won't be out in that, but they will still be existing in that. And so some of that light is going to be thrown down through the jungle and it is going to reach them and, you know, particular shafts of light. They may choose to sleep directly in one of those shafts of light occasionally or near to one and therein they are going to be exposed to UV. So what I also do for my crested gecko is provide him with a gentle UV output from an Arcadia Shade Dweller unit. 
Now there are a huge number of benefits of providing UV exposure in the right quantities to any reptile really. Um, now I will talk about these in more detail in another video, um, but basically some of the most obvious and poignant ones are that it does allow them to see better because reptiles can see into the ultraviolet and it also allows them to synthesize vitamin D3, the sunshine vitamin, through naturally evolved processes rather than just you trying to meet it up with dietary supplementation. And finally, visible light, it is going to help them have a better day-night cycle. So if you have some really bright lighting in there for 12 hours a day, then they are going to know it's daytime and they're going to know to come out when that goes off. And also it is essential to make the enclosure look good and also to grow plants, of course. This visible light is provided through an Arcadia Jungle Dawn LED bar. To measure the temperatures, you are going to want a thermometer. Um, there are a range of these available, um, and I have talked about the merits of each of them in a past video. But basically, to summarise, you're going to want to use a digital probe thermometer as your basic reading thing, and then you can also back up that information with an infrared temperature gun. And the last thing I'm going to mention, oh, I've just kicked the tripod. So the last thing that I'm going to mention in this little subsection of the video is actually about thermostats. Now, a thermostat is something that if, you know, you probably know this already, but it's something that you're going to use to attempt to control the temperature. Um, now, personally, I do always recommend incandescent heat lamps like the one I'm using with my Crested Gecko, which again is something I've talked about in another video. But if you are going to go down the route of using one of those, then you do want to use a dimming thermostat rather than any of the other types available. Now, to be completely honest with you, whether you actually need a thermostat in this instance is debatable um, because you are only going to be using a low wattage heating element. I think the one I'm using at the minute is only 25 watts. So it is just providing a very localised hotspot that the Crested Gecko can escape from. And so to use a thermostat on it is like not really essential, but it's definitely something that I would recommend for peace of mind. So by now you're probably wondering what you've got to feed a Crestie. Once again, what people recommend is generally not the right stuff. So what they'll say is you can offer a Crested Gecko meal replacement powder, such as Ripashi or Pangea or Arcadia's Sticky Foot Gold, um, to which you just add water to like a powder, and then the Crested Gecko goes and licks it up. Then people will also recommend that you can try offering insects to your Crestie on maybe a monthly basis, and that is just gonna be something else for them to eat. Wild studies, however, have shown that Crested Geckos actually eat a lot more insect matter than people give them credit for. It's in the range of about 50%. Um, so this is what you want to be doing with your reptile. What I do with my Crested Gecko is I actually feed him about twice a week one feed with the meal replacement powder or Crested Gecko diet, and another feed using insects. If you were paying attention a moment ago, you'll have noticed that I did mention dietary supplementation with vitamin D3, and this is something else that you've got to keep in mind. Now then, in the wild, a reptile, or you know, in this case a Crested Gecko, is going to be getting all sorts of minerals and vitamins from its diet, because what it's going to be eating is a completely broad range of plants and other little animals. And in captivity, they obviously aren't going to be getting that. And the shortfalls created, we do just have to pick them up with supplements. The supplements that I personally like to use are Arcadia's Earth Pro supplements. So there is Arcadia Earth Pro A and Arcadia's Earth Pro Calcium Pro Magnesium. I think that's what it's called now, it's a, it's a long name. Uh, but basically, you use the A1 for three feeds, then you use the Calcium and Magnesium one for one feed, then you do three more feeds of Earth Pro A, and then you do one feed of something else. This something else, if you provide UV lighting, is generally just going to be the Calcium Pro Magnesium again, but you can also, like, sometimes people choose to offer it every eight feeds, or maybe just once a month even, um, and that is something that does have preformed dietary vitamin D3 and vitamin A and things in it, and um, for this, purpose I do choose to use Rapashi's Calcium Plus Low D, I think that's what it's called, um, but basically that is a good product for that job. 
To provide the supplementation, don't do it with the like meal replacement powders because they've got supplements added already. Just do it with the insects. So what you want to do is like put them in a little cup or a bag or something, pour a little scoop of the supplement on and give it a good shake so that they're coated. You don't want them completely white like little snowmen. You just want to have a little bit on there and that's going to do the job. So now that we've discussed housing, lighting, humidity, temperatures, the other thing that we've got to discuss, oh hang on, we've discussed feeding as well, let's not forget that. Uh, so the other thing that we want to discuss is handling and temperament of crested geckos. Once again, I'm going to have to be a little bit controversial in that people generally recommend that crested geckos are a good animal for handling because they don't bite and they aren't aggressive. And whilst this is true, I personally don't think that handling crested geckos on a regular basis is always a good thing to do. Now the reason for this is that crested geckos are very flighty animals by nature. So people, you will hear it asked a lot, like people say, how do I get my crested gecko to stop jumping away from me? Well, the thing is, crested geckos jump by nature, um, but they tend not to do it unless they're in a panic. And when you think about it, that means that they've got to be stressed out when you're holding them. So it's just for your benefit and not the animals in this case, really. Plus the other thing is like the regularity with which crested geckos shed their tails. If crested geckos weren't afraid, they wouldn't shed their tails because it is vital for them and it's not going to, well, you know, vital. It's a useful thing for a crested gecko to have because the tail is partially prehensile and helps them to climb. So they're not just going to dump that for no reason. So the fact that so many captive crested geckos have shed their tails just goes to show that something's scaring them. Now that isn't to say that you shouldn't handle a crested gecko. Every reptile is genuinely different and they are far more intelligent than most people ever give them credit for. So if your crested gecko is one that like asks to come out and see, like, you know, it really seems to genuinely enjoy handling, Without anthropomorphizing them, you know, in that case, handling is a good thing. But if they don't and they're just running away, then don't force yourself upon them. But anyway, if you are handling a crested gecko, then what you should just do is just support the body weight. If they're going to jump, catch them and, you know, try not to let them run up the walls because it's going to be difficult getting them back. But as long as you're gentle with them, then although they might be a bit scared, they aren't aggressive animals and they're not gonna like tear you to shreds even if they do bite you. So, you know, just keep all that in mind. We haven't got that yet. <laughs> oh well, he definitely I doesn't want to cooperate, does he? I don't think this one's happening. And really, I think that's about it for this guide for Crested Gecko Care. Now hopefully I've gone through everything that you were wondering about in this video, so now you do have a general gist of whether you want a crested gecko, and if you're going to get one, then you do have a good idea of what you're going to have to do to care for it. Now like I say, once again, if you do want any of the products or like anything that you need to care for a crested gecko, then though all those things will be linked via Amazon in the description of this video, so you can pick them up if you want. If I did leave any stones unturned, then do leave comments down in the description and I'll get to you as quick as I can to try and help you out if you've got a query for keeping Cresties. But anyway, I hope now that you do just really know what you wanted to know. And if you did, then please subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next video. So I've been JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.